Hi, welcome to Calvary Church Online. I'm Pastor Kathleen, the Connections and Serve Teams pastor here at Calvary. And we're really glad you're in this space, whether it's your very first time or you just missed last Sunday and you're wanting to catch up. We're glad that you're here. As always, if you just want to know what happens around here at Calvary in our church community, how you can get connected, please go to our website, calvaryptbo.church. Click the I'm new tab and fill out that digital connect card and our connections team would love to get in touch with you and let you know how you can better connect to us and we can introduce ourselves to you. As we go into our message with Pastor Michelle this morning, let's first spend some time in worship. Worship is just a really incredible time to just realign your heart, calm your mind and focus on Jesus Christ who, hey, he already knows it all anyways, right? So let's just give him our attention, give him whatever we're carrying, and let's just free ourselves as we worship the risen Christ today.
Good morning, Calvary. It's so great to be with you today. And we are continuing in our series called Transformed Pockets. And we're talking about living a life of transformation in the area of our finances. What would it look like as a disciple of Jesus to be fully transformed in the area of stewardship, taking care of that which God has entrusted us with? And so this week, we're talking about a pretty difficult subject, actually. We're talking about debt. Romans 13 says this in verse seven, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the con continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. So important to realize that, uh, that we are able to walk in freedom when we are without owing anything to anyone. And that's difficult in this day in society, isn't it? So today, as you listen to this message, may you be encouraged that God is with you in the process of working through your finances and being able to overcome the burden of debt. In fact, we're gonna talk a lot about bricks today. And the reason being is because debt is kind of like putting a brick intentionally into your pocket and letting it just stay there and thinking that it's not going to over time uh, erode away at the very pockets that hold the treasures we're called to steward. And so enjoy this message today. If you have any questions, we'd happy to be happy to talk with you at the church. We pray that God will speak to you about living a life that's transformed by him. If you have pockets, put your hands in your pockets right now. Everyone has pockets. Some are a little deeper than others. It doesn't matter if your pockets are deep or shallow, tired or worn, brand new or still being formed. God wants to transform them. Pockets being, in this illustration, the vessels that hold your treasures. Last week, instead of focusing on the last time we met, instead of focusing on the issues of what's in your pockets, we asked this question, who weaves the threads that hold your pockets in place. And Psalm chapter 24, verse one says this, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. God himself, he equips us to be vessels. He's the actual thread that holds the pockets in place. He equips us to be vessels stewarding all that he has created. And so the question we have is, what does a disciple of Jesus look like when their financial life is also transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit? What does, this, does a disciple look like? So last week, we, we talked a little bit about what that would look like. Can I put up the slide there with our, our kind of our, this is what you missed a couple of weeks ago. We said a transformed life in finances. Transformation looks like this. It looks like entrustment not entitlement. It looks like transformation serves God's purposes and not our own. And transformation trusts God's provision and not our capacity. Aren't you glad we're trusting on his provision and not our own capacity? Amen? Amen. And so what I did a couple weeks ago was that I had, uh, I had Vanna Duane come up here, as someone called him, <laughs> And he held up this blanket that his mom had made for, for us and our family. This is a little bit upside down here. But in this blanket, this is our picnic blanket that we had as a family that she made for us. And it's made out of pockets. And we talked about how all of our pockets together kind of weave together to do the work of the kingdom. How God placed all of us together to be able to, to do his work in the area of stewardship. But I thought I'd share another one of Elaine Mercer's creations today. Are you okay with that? Oh, all right, this one here. This is Elaine's creation that's actually, this is one of my favorites. And she sent this to me once. And, and I carry this whenever I go somewhere for like a quick overnight or I need to go to a conference or something. And, and she made this beautiful, beautiful bag that's made out of jean fabric and all this stuff. And, and, and I, I said to Dwayne, this would have been the good week to launch Elaine's Etsy uh, account but she doesn't have one despite us encouraging her to. Uh, so anyways, I brought this bag along because today's uh, 
thing that we're going to show in, in the pocket didn't, I didn't want to ruin the pocket by putting it in here, but today um, what we have in here right now are these bricks. Two of my exercises. Thanks to Mel who told me where I could find bricks in the church. And so um, here we go. One, there's a couple here. Bricks. Imagine if you had to carry around a brick in your back pocket. Imagine how awkward and difficult that would be. And I want to tell you today that when I was thinking about the picture of what does debt look like when debt is out of control, when it's bad debt, when it's, it's debt that has accumulated over a long period of time, it literally feels like bricks in your pockets, doesn't it? The reason we didn't want to put the bricks in this pocket right here was because it would eventually put a hole and wear out these pockets. And, and isn't that what debt does as well? It, it takes up the space that we would use to steward God's treasures, to steward the things God has equipped us with. Um, and it just wears on us. And suddenly it feels like we have a holes in our pockets and everything we're putting in, any treasure, any funds that we are stewarding, it just goes right out the holes that have been created by years and years of debt. In simple terms, debt is owing any money to anybody for any reason. And this can include credit cards. I don't know why we're amening debt. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> this can include credit cards, card lo car loans, lines of credit, mortgages, student loans, borrow money from a friend. If you owe it, you, you owe it. And if we were to ask, what is the average debt level in Canada? According to Equifax, at the end of 2020, the average Canadian owed $72,950 in debt, excluding mortgages. Approximately $80,000 the average Canadian owed in non-mortgage debt. The average Canadian owes $3,929 on their credit cards. Additionally, the average Canadian owes 20,000, approximately $20,000 in student loans, $22,000 in car loans, that's a nice car, and $13,986,000 in personal loans. So if you're carrying a load of debt, stats say that guess what? You're not alone. Borrowing money is actually not considered a sin in the Bible. But we are given instructions about the expectation in regards to borrowed items and returning them. It goes way back to even Exodus chapter 22, verse 14. It says, if anyone borrows an animal, remember these are, these are commodities in biblical times and agricultural lands. If anyone borrows an animal from their neighbor and it is injured or dies while the owner is not present, they must make restitution. They borrowed it. If you break it, you own it, replace it kind of thing. Psalm 37 verse 21 says, The wicked borrows but does not pay back. Not that the wicked borrows is the evil part. The wicked borrows but does not pay back. But the righteous is generous and gives. You see, that's why we want to not have, be weighed down by the burden of debt because it prevents us it's filling up our pockets it prevents us from being able to be generous and give as the righteous are called to do romans 13 says give to everyone what you owe them if you owe taxes pay taxes if revenue then revenue if respect then respect if honor then honor and let no debt turn to one someone and say no debt let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. What a beautiful idea. What a beautiful imagery as Paul is instructing the church about generosity and about giving. And he says, let there be no debt remain outstanding except this debt to love one another. And the weight of debt is felt the longer you carry it. And because of today's systems of commerce, debt doesn't naturally get smaller over time, does it? 
In fact, it accrues interest upon interest and causing some to crumble under its burden, becoming subject to our debt, and thereby our debt becomes our Lord. That everything submits to that debt. So today we want to share a few tips. And we want to try to keep it light. A few tips about how to have a financial life that is transformed by godly principles. How many people are in for that today? Yeah, you're in for that? All right. Take notes. It'll help you track a little bit. Please note that we are not financial advisors as a church. Our our specialty is spiritual disciplines. (laughs) But there is something to be said about taking our spiritual disciplines and applying them practically. And if you're in a situation that is beyond your, your capability then we want to encourage you to go and find professional financial services and help. And we can even maybe direct you if that's needed to be able to get the help you need to be able to pull yourself and be able to be pulled out of the the debt situation you're in. Uh, But we want to encourage you and bless you and and pray for you as as you're doing your due diligence here today. Number one, the best way to be transformed in this area and not to be weighed down by debt is simply this. Whenever given the choice, say no to debt. By saying yes to unnecessary debt, which let's clarify for a moment here. I know that when we talked about people's debt load, they excluded mortgages. There's a reason for that. Because there's not very many people in this economy and in, in, in this part, part of history where you can pay for a house up front. But yet you need a house up front. And so there's this idea that there is responsible debt that you can accrue, that you can manage. And often the banks will help you to do that and others will help you to make good choices in regards to good debt. Student loans, for some people, there's no way they would be able to go to school unless they got their student loan from the government. Without their student loan, they wouldn't have their schooling. Without their schooling, they wouldn't be able to make more than minimum wage. And so there's these investment pieces that require a temporary debt that needs to be paid even according to the principles of scripture. But saying yes to unnecessary debt is kind of like picking up one of these bricks and choosing under your own free will to put it in your pocket. Now I'm going to share a couple stories today just from our own lives and I and I hope that you uh, you understand that it's for the purpose of of being able to walk through this and picture what it's like. But how many people remember being first married in your first home? Raise your hand if you remember that. So I remember our very first home that we bought, the first one we were renting, the very first home we bought. And because our first apartment was fully furnished, we went into our house and we sat on the floor in the living room the first couple of days. (laughs) And we maybe pulled out a couple of uh, lawn chairs and sat there. And we, it was, it was kind of cute, rom- oh, cute and romantic at the time. But uh, we decided we needed to buy a couch. And I remember this one occasion where we decided we needed a couch. And so we went to like Leon's or the Brick. I think it was the Brick at the time. And they said, you can buy this couch and pay for this much up front. Or you can pay for it interest-free for the year and pay it, start pay, making payments one year from now, which you could pay it out full or you could start a pl- payment plan. And I remember thinking, well, there's a lot, especially when you're first married, that you could do with that money. This is, we're like in our 20s here. We could do with that money right now, knowing that we've got jobs, knowing that everything, you know, we're going to be able to pay for it then. We could pay for it right now, but we decide to defer the payment for one full year. Do you know how exciting it was to start payments on that couch that was no longer a new couch, but a semi-new couch in one year's time? I can honestly say we never did that again regarding a piece of furniture because it just... It didn't make sense. It was like we chose to carry around, it was almost like a secret brick in our pocket that weighed us down knowing that that payment was due in one year's time. Yeah, no interest on it, but it was due. And if we didn't start paying it, then interest would start to accrue. It kind of flows often. There's so many, there's so many opportunities for us to either pay now, buy now, pay later, or pay in installments. 
I remember ordering something for the girls online, some kind of clothing item, and it was such a small amount, like it was under $50, and it said, would you like to pay for it up front full, or would you like to pay for it in installments? I'm like, it's $50. Why would I, why would I pay more in installments? But it's this idea, this mindset that comes that we talked about a consumer mindset versus consumer mindset versus a Christ-like mindset. And the consumer mindset says, I need that now, I'll just pay for it later. Going into debt to defer an expense makes this dangerous assumption about the future. James 4, verse 13 to 15 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and spend a year there, here uh, and make a profit, yet you do not know, the Bible says, what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say this, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or do that. And this is the tricky part, isn't it? And I'm speaking to young people today because perhaps you haven't had a chance to really experience what it's like to have to pay something back yet or to have not sure what the next year is going to hold or no guarantee of a job in 12 months' time. And so... We don't have a guarantee that we'll be able to do what we hope we'll be able to do in a year or in two years when that payment is due. So whenever you get a chance to not go in debt, then take that chance to not be in debt. Choose, say no to debt whenever you're given a choice. Number two, when it comes to our, our debt load, Number two says, make a goal and a plan to stay out of debt. I was watching a series recently. It was last month when I was preparing for this, this series. And it was regarding, um, it was from Right Now Media. How many people know what Right Now Media is? Raise your hand. So if you don't know what Right Now Media is, I want you just to encourage you to, uh, to reach out to the church. We want to make sure that you get the link that is for Right Now Media uh, which is an, a subscription. It's like Netflix for Bible studies. And it's free for you at the church that you can go and you can find any topic. In fact, if you put financial into the, into the search bar, you'll get at least six or seven different videos that you can watch and even do uh, some homework on and things that, just on your own study to be able to learn what it means to a good steward. But I was watching one of these videos last month and it, if it talked about um, if we focus on a goal of what we would do once we were out of debt and we aimed for that goal, then guess what? We would stay motivated to get out of debt sooner. I mean, there's some bigger examples here in this room that how after a while, while the call to get out of debt and to give to the get out of debt gets very stale after a while discouraging it becomes heavy and the debt becomes the biggest issue and, and it can be the same for our personal lives as well that we're just like I just got to pay off that debt pay off that off that debt and this wise financial guru on this on this uh, right now media website or on this series he had spoken about the fact that if we were to focus on the goal of what we could do without having debt Give more generously. Go on that missions trip. Be able to send your kids to, to camp and Christian camps to be able to do the things that, that you may be finding difficult to do. He said if you focus on the goal of what you plan to do by being out of debt, it will motivate us to pay down that debt. Make a goal. I want to encourage you today to ask God to help you make healthy goals when you're, what you would do when you're out of debt then allow those goals, the kingdom goals, not like I'd like to buy an, a new car because my other car is not as good, but actually kingdom goals to motivate you. As a church family, as I alluded to a moment ago, there was a difficult decision was made to get out from under the debt of our church that we were in. 
And it wasn't so much that the church carried a mortgage because the majority of churches actually do carry a mortgage. It's like the majority of you who own a house carry a mortgage as well. Nothing wrong with church mortgages. But over time, that mortgage was not being able to be uh, brought down in the principles. The principles were not being able to pay it off the same way. And the cost of the expenses of the building became so much, so great, that even the ability to someday be out of debt in this building was too far out of reach. Impossible. And so difficult decisions were made regarding this building and people, wise people before even I arrived in our team, uh, they were making these difficult decisions regarding the building of this church. And what was the goal that kept them motivated? The thought of being in a building that would not cause the weight of every single repair to feel so strong. The thought of being in a building that would be more conducive to the ministries that we want to do. The thought of being able to one day start fresh. Those are the things that would motivate us. Not because having a mortgage payment was wrong. Absolutely not. There's reasonable mortgage loads for healthy churches to carry. But the goal that motivated us is a building and still does is a building that will better suit our purposes with the least amount of debt and ideally no debt that's going to take all of our efforts as a church family to be able to accomplish. It's exciting when you know the goal and keep focused on it and determine to minimize the debt, both in your personal lives and in your family life and in your, our collective life as a church family. So here's three ways to stay out of debt. And I brought some more props. It's a really good day, guys. You came to church on a good day. Again, I feel like I'm being very personal today. And, I, and, uh, and, and so hear me out. If you have any questions about this, we're happy. Dwayne will be happy to talk with you too. Okay, I only got two out of three. That's okay. Yep. All right. First thing, use a cash flow plan. These are two of about 10 pencil cases that we have at home that we've carried with us through every move. But we had even early days when we were in an apartment, in the basement apartment, without any kids. And we decided that there was only, well, we knew. We didn't decide. It was decided for us. There was only limited amount of cash flow available each and every month. So we would take, as we could, the funds that we had already budgeted for. Budget is a big part of that cash flow plan. And we would put them in envelopes. And when we needed groceries, we grabbed the grocery one. And we would take the money out and put it to buy groceries. And when we got to the end of the month and we still needed some groceries, we'd look to see how much was left inside of the little envelope. And if there was $40 left, that's what we used to buy the groceries for the rest of that month. We didn't want to get overwhelmed with debt. We didn't want to use our credit cards. Now, as we matured, we were able to balance using credit cards and being able to keep, do things digitally, transferring. I mean, things have changed quite a bit over the years. But when you're struggling, when you're having difficult, go back to cash. <laughs> cash flow plan. You have this much money to spend. Use it. If you don't use it that month for your gifts, we had one that was called gifts. And as the kids got older, if they had a birthday party, we were putting in like $40 every paycheck towards gifts that would happen for birthday parties. We'd go to the envelope, pull it out, pay for the birthday party gift. Instead of putting everything on our card, if you're struggling to stay out of debt, can I encourage you to go with a cash flow plan? Secondly, maintain an emergency fund. That's understandable. If you can do that for the sake that someday if... When you don't, we can't predict the future. You don't know what that job looks like a year from now. Then having an emergency fund, even a little bit put away over and over again that you can go to later on if you get into a situation where you'd prefer to stay out of debt. Thirdly, remember who you are and who you are not. We talked about this wonderful statement at the end of our last time together where we said, I'm on a transformational journey in the area of my finance. That was really about allowing ourselves to be reminded of whose we are, that we don't 
have to buy everything, that we don't need everything up front, that we can trust that we are not a consumer, but we are a contributor to the kingdom of heaven and remind ourselves of who we are. So those are three simple steps, really simple steps to stay out of debt. If we fail to make a plan, some would say we plan to fail. In fact, I think there's, it was Frank, Benjamin Franklin who said, if we fail to plan, we plan to fail. And so my encouragement today, if you do nothing else at the end of this message, is to decide to go home and make a plan. For some of you who already have a plan, and the goal will be to keep to the plan and stay faithful to the plan. Eventually, all those bricks begin to build a wall between you and the road to financial freedom. And, and we spoke about it even in our song today about freedom in Christ. He wants you to be free even in the area of your finances. So make a choice to say no to debt. Make a goal and a plan to stay out of debt. And watch the Lord do, help you in that process. Proverbs 21 verse 5 says, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. And some of our bad habits, and I'm speaking to ourselves as much as you, but some of our habits come simply because we didn't slow down long enough to make some goals and a plan. I want to encourage you, it's never too late to do that today. There are resources and financial professionals who are available, and perhaps that's the perfect place for you to start. Thirdly, and lastly, take action. Take action and stay faithful to the process. What process, you may ask? Well, there's a lot of different processes, but often the biggest hurdle is coming face to face with the truth, that it's too much to handle, that you need others to come alongside of you, and you need Christian and professional advice. And a financial Christian advisor will talk through the specifics of your debt load. And, and if it's gotten too heavy of a weight to bear, bear, they may consider some of the following things. Consolidating of loans. It's sometimes helpful option for people when they can adjust to a better interest rate. Another strategy is to pay off the loan with the highest interest rate first. That's like this avalanche kind of plan. Pay off the loan with the highest interest rate. The problem with that is that sometimes the one with the highest interest rate is the biggest one. And so it feels like you're never, ever going to get that, that debt down. But we had another strategy that we followed for a little while that was really helpful to us. And uh, it came from the Christian financial guy, Dave Ramsey. Has anyone ever heard of Dave Ramsey? And it was called the debt snowball. And again, this is just like some practical advice that might be helpful to you. But step one says, list your debts from smallest. That might be too small, but that's okay. You can look at it. I can send it to you later. But uh, list your debts from smallest to largest, regardless of the interest rate. Make the minimum payments on your, all your debts except for the smallest debts. So you still got to pay them back. Remember, that's a biblical principle. Throw as much extra money as you can. Sometimes pick up an extra job, sell some things around your house, do whatever, let go of cable for a little while, <laughs> right? Go down to one streaming app, not five. And make minimum payments on all your debts except for the smallest debts, but then throw as much extra money, step three, as you can on your smallest debt until it's gone. I remember thinking we had student loans and they had the lowest interest rate and so we kept them for like 10 years <laughs> remember we had our children and i was like we still have a debt student loans from peterborough going to school <laughs> and we made the choice because there was just such a small amount left that we would pay that one off put everything we could to pay that one off and then take those payment amounts, $200, whatever it was a month, and throw it on the next smallest debt. And then pay that one off. Go work as much as you can. Put extra things in. Get rid of stuff. Cut back on stuff. Put extra onto that loan. Get rid of that next s smallest debt. 
And then those payments, which might be $400 a month, suddenly you take th those savings and you put it on the next one. And guess what? It's like a snowball going down a hill. It just picks up speed and suddenly you're cutting out debts. And I remember when we cut out our first car that we had a payment on and we were, it was paid in full, the car broke down the very next day. <laughs> like that's what happens, right? But nonetheless, we were so proud because we were being good stewards because our finances were being transformed as we were being strategic, as we were taking steps. And you repeat that until each debt is paid in full and you're completely debt free. Hallelujah. Part of being faithful stewards is doing the smaller but significant things to align with the transformation process that you are in. Cut one of those streaming devices. Bring your lunch to work. Have a staycation this summer. Fast from your online shopping for at least a month. Sell some things just lying around your house that you don't need and put it on that smallest debt load or whatever choice you go with the highest interest rate, whatever, whatever method you choose to do. And then watch the faithfulness begin to have rewards and fruit. The last illustration I want to give to you, it comes from Luke chapter 10. And there's not a, a lot of discussion. Or, I mean, Jesus talked about money for sure because he was talking about their hearts. He's talking about how the, the Pharisees, they just like to flaunt their money and they were causing uh, such dissension between the rich and the poor and Luke 10, Jesus tells his disciples this story. He says, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account on your man, of your management because you cannot be a manager any longer. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. And so this manager, the steward, he doesn't own the business. He's working, taking care of the business and the funds. And he starts to go around to all of the people who owed accounts to that company. And he says, you owe like $1,000, let's say. We're going to take that down to $600. Pay me back that. And so people were excited. Their debts were being cut down. And it was actually like a biblical principle. There's this thing like this, the year of Jubilee you'll hear about in Leviticus. And we, we hear Jesus declare that he is, uh, he now has initiated the year of Jubilee when he came to pay the debt for our, pri for our sin. It's beautiful imagery. But there was this thing in the, in Jewish culture where you could be merciful and you should be merciful and cut debts for people, it's particularly a certain time in the, in the festival calendar where after, at the 50 year mark, at the year of Jubilee, that they would d get rid of all debts so that society would be able to start over again and there would just be this mercy that would be thrown all over people. Uh, interesting, right, compared to our society now? So this manager decides he's going to, probably out of a bit of an understanding, of his liberty to be able to show some kind of mercy, he starts showing mercy, but it's so that all those people will be his friends once he's without a job. And he starts cutting all the debts, and he, he gets back some of the money. And the Bible says, verse 8, that the master, the owner, commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. And there's something to be said about taking action something that might feel extreme a little bit in your household to sell that thing that's been sitting in your basement that everyone's been you know said oh we can't get rid of that and you're like no we're gonna do that why because we're gonna we're gonna take an action that's strong and we're gonna put it towards our debt I don't know why I'm using that example today is there something in our basement that you want me to sell Dwayne yeah But Jesus ends this, 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 this discussion. Verse 10 of 16, he says this, or 16 of, of chapter 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. 
you may think some of these ideas or action steps suggested are so little. Maybe you think there's no way they're going to help get you out of this pit that you're in or the pockets that are full of holes at this point in time. But I want to encourage you. Be trustworthy with the little that God has asked you to do. The single steps, the plan for prevention, the paying off of those debts, God cares about them because he wants you to be able to walk in liberty in freedom so that nothing of this world would hold you back from maybe being able to do anything he asks you to do in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. I'm going to call the worship team to come on up at this time. We're going to end with this song that we were just singing, Jesus be the center of it all. And isn't that really what it's about? When it comes to the choices that we make about our finances, the way that we build our future, that we look towards the future, putting Jesus at the center of it is really what he's called us to do, to make him first, to make him our priority because he wants to transform us. He wants our life to be one that's full of freedom and liberty in Christ. Now, here's the thing. In the Bible, they speak about debt because it was still a common part of life. There's some of you here who you have gone through difficult and incredible trauma or situations that you were not prepared for, and it's caused you to have to go into debt. There was no choice for you. May I remind you today that being in debt is not a sin not paying back or choosing not to pay back your debt or not making choices to eliminate that debt, that's where it starts to get the Holy Spirit speak into our hearts and pulling on us. It's about our choices, what we do with what we've been given in life. And God, by his Holy Spirit, he wants to give you wisdom in how to manage those things. He wants to give you encouragement when you think there's no, this isn't, this is impossible. I'm weighed down. No, the Bible says our our burdens are supposed to be light and not heavy. He's walking with us in the yoke. He's the one who's carrying our burdens with us. He's not making us feel the weight all by ourselves. And if you are, turn to him and say, Jesus, I need you to carry this with me. And he will because he's faithful. And so I want to encourage you today as we sing these words to the song, let it be an anthem in our hearts that we're submitting everything back to Jesus and his lordship in our life. And we're making a commitment and a plan in our hearts to stay as debt-free as humanly possible, to make good choices in how we steward our finances, both collectively and in our individual lives and families. And we're going to trust God that it's not about our capacity but it's about his provision as we take the wise steps to move forward in what he calls us to do for the kingdom thank you so much pastor michelle i really hope that you feel encouraged by that message instead of overwhelmed and you can just make a plan to get at least one of those bricks just off your back and feel a little lighter as you navigate your way through life Hey, I just want to say happy Father's Day to all of our dads, but also to all of the men out there who are pointing the next generation to Christ. Thank you. Your position is invaluable, and we are so glad that you are in our world. Keep doing what you're doing. We hope to see you next week here in this space again. 